the government has a special limitation. They are required to consider you innocent until you're proven guilty. Not only that, but they cannot proceed without you. They have to get personal jurisdiction over you before they can proceed against you. So what they do is they arrest you and they bring you in they, and, and they, they have this little thing called an arraignment. Why do they have arraignment? The reason is is because they are securing your agreement to a court not of record. Okay? They say to you, you are accused of violating statute or code such and such. Not common law, but code. How do you plead? Do you plead that it's a valid statute but you're not guilty? Do you plead it's a valid statute but you are guilty? Or do you plead it's a valid statute and no contest? Okay, in all cases you're pleading with a valid statute. Now they don't say that. All they say is you're accused of violating it and if you take the bait and give them a, a guilty, not guilty, or no contest, you've automatically agreed to the validity of the jurisdiction. Okay, the code. The fourth choice they never tell you, which is I demand a common law court. I demand proceeding in common law in accordance with California Constitution, Article 6, Paragraph 1. And so that's how it's right there. But you have a primary right to contract. So they contract you into an alternative system. Okay? So, now, just exactly what is the common law? Well, again, all the attorneys are taught that common law is case law. But let's take a look here. In truth, common law is generally understood by everybody that not only is it case law, but it's also the common law of England as it was in 1776 when we declared our independence. Okay? And the Constitution recognizes the common law. But it's still unwritten. Now, what does unwritten mean? Unwritten does not mean that it's not written. What it means is that there is no common pinpoint source where you can find the common law defined. Okay? If you look at statutory law, it's real easy with statutory law. You just go to the legislative record, you show there, that's where it came from. There's a procedure followed. Common law doesn't work that way. Basically, the sovereign decrees whatever he thinks the law is, and if public opinion agrees, that's the common law. So, bureaucrats do not particularly understand common law, okay? So you've got to give them something to get their teeth into, because everything has to be in writing. You know, that's how bureaucrats are. So how do you put it in writing? Well, it turns out that we have this little thing called the Confirmatio Catarum. And what happened was the Magna Carta came along. Magna Carta basically put some limitations on King John. They basically told him, look, you know, sign this or we'll cut your head off. So he signed it. <laughs> and the Pope blessed it. But about a year later, uh, the Pope died and King John died. It was a remarkable coincidence. They were died within like about three months of each other, three, four months. And they created a power vacuum in the religious side and they created a power vacuum on the king side, but the noblemen were still organized. They had no power vacuum. So the first thing they, they understood... You know, they're smart. And they went, they immediately went to the new king who had not yet established his power base and they got him to recertify the Magna Carta. And every king after that recertified it to some degree or other with some minor modifications. And uh, so that, that's how the Magna Carta was kept alive and it grew stronger with time. Well, King Edward the first came along and he was likewise weak, and the demands were made on him to recertify it. So he came up with this document called the Confirmatio Catarum. It's up there on the screen. Here. Now it's a little bigger, I think. It'll be a little bigger. There. Now can you read it? Confirmatio Catarum. And this is really a, a neat little item. Okay. And right here, this is the king speaking. Okay. And he says in the Confirmatio Cartarum, We have confirmed them in all points, and that our justices, sheriffs, mayors, and other ministers, which under us have the laws of our land to guide, shall allow the said charters pleaded before them in judgment in all their points. That is, to wit, the great charter as the common law, and the charter of force, the wealth of our realm. So, the great charter, that's the Magna Carta, another name for Magna Carta. The 
Magna Carta is her law. But notice what it says. It says that all of these things officers shall allow them pleaded. In other words, you don't have to use the common the uh, Magna Carta, but if you choose to call the Magna Carta the common law, the officials must accept it as such. Okay? So it's optional with you whether or not it's common law. But they have to take it if you demand it. Okay, so that is the great connection. That's the connection between the Constitution and the Magna Carta, is the, is the Confirmatio Cartara. Believe it or not, I found this in a uh, Bar Association law book. <clears throat> I think I give the credit at the end of the article. But the Magna Carta is the common law. Magna Carta is good law in the United States especially if you as a sovereign decree it so, okay? And in my papers, you'll see, I decree it so. All right, so that's the Confirmatio Catarum, and from there we go to the Magna Carta, and the Magna Carta has uh, a variety of things that are kind of handy. Uh, the one that I'm looking forward to uh, uh, developing sometime in the future is Article 61. I love Article 61. This is the best article in the whole thing, I think. Article 61 defines the procedure for, a, uh, for setting up and running a grand jury. That's a real grand jury. I want you to notice something. The Magna Carta specifies specifically 25 members of the nobility are the grand jury. Okay? 25 people. We are all grand jurors, potentially. We are people, I hope we're all people in here, okay? Do we have 25 in here? Yeah. We have enough for a grand jury? Yeah. <laughs> I count 22, 25, exactly. 25, exactly. Boy, we can tear up the landscape here, the legal landscape. Okay. <clears throat> Not citizens. See, you know you're entitled to a jury of your peers. What's the definition of a peer? You ever thought about that? Yes. Who knows what the definition of a peer is? Anybody? Member of the peerage. Member of the peerage, right. What's the peerage? That's the nobility. In America, in America, before we created citizens of the United States with the 14th Amendment, everybody was a peer unless he was a slave or an Indian. Okay? So everybody was a peer. Today, regardless of color, everybody is a peer, okay? Because we prohibited d discrimination. So, we're all peers, we're members of the peerage. So when you're, you're entitled to a jury of your peers, that means somebody who knows he's a sovereign. And there was a case in San Diego about 10 years ago or so. I wish I'd followed up so I could cite it and tell you exactly what it was, but I didn't. I was too innocent at the time to appreciate this, but this guy demanded a jury of his peers, real peers, and there was not a single person in the jury pool who would admit that he wasn't a citizen of the United States. <laughs> they all insisted that they were subjects, right, subject to the jurisdiction. Well, that's not a peer. So finally, the judge ordered the sheriff to go out and gather up some peers, okay, because that's the sheriff's authorized to bring in people if necessary arrest them for jury duty, okay? <laughs> he could not find a single person, and he had to report back to the court. He couldn't find any peers. So they had to dismiss the case. They couldn't proceed because it was a right to have a jury of peers.